So this is going to be the second message in the series I'm calling Faith and Hope. I've changed the subtitle a little bit from living a lifestyle of wisdom and revelation to living in the balance of wisdom and revelation. And if you haven't been here and you haven't heard these, um, you know, I just, I just really felt like from the Lord to, to focus the first part of the year, but it's almost starting to feel like it'll be kind of the theme of the year, faith and hope. And faith being not what you do to get God to respond to you, you know, because those of us that believe in the working of the Spirit, we believe we should be seeing miracles, we believe we should see the supernatural in effect. Oftentimes, faith is taught from the perspective of if you get more of it, or you, do, you get stronger with it, or you get better at it, somehow there's some kind of lack of faith on your end, and you need more faith, and then the more you get more faith, then God will move for you. And it's like, that, that's... that's works-based. That's a, that's a works-based mentality, but it sounds spiritual because faith is a spiritual gift, but it's still dead works. Anything that you feel like you've got to do to get God to move for you is a dead work because the reality is Christ has completed the work. Now, He's completed you in your spirit. In your spirit, you're perfect. That you, If you were to pass away in this moment, that eternal aspect of you that comes out of your body transitions on and it's whole and healed, but that's who you actually are now. On the inside of you, you are joined with God. You are eternal inwardly. And what we're trying to do as believers, as those who follow Jesus, is allow that which has, God has done inside of us to manifest and affect all the rest of our being. And we do that through the renewing of our mind. Romans 12, 2, we talk about this a lot. We're transformed as we renew our mind so that we prove out the will of God, right? You bear out or you prove out or you work out the will of God, which is for you to experience everything that Christ paid for you to experience because on the inside, it's done. There's no work for you to do to stay saved. Christ has done it. In the blood of Christ, you are secure whole and healed. <clears throat> and the thing about that is everything that you need from God is in Christ and Christ is in you. I'm not saying God just did everything and he kicked back and he's got his feet up in heaven and he's like, you figure it out yourself. There is a relationship. He's interactive. There is this aspect of asking even though we have already received. So it's that paradox. It's that living in the balance of wisdom and revelation but it all comes together in the knowledge of Christ. So this is the passage that just part of the prayer in Ephesians 1.17, uh, Paul is praying, and, and this is part of your homework I gave last week, but just, you know, go. I, I would say, see, I don't, I don't want to just give you a sermon. You get something interesting out of it. You go home. You forget about it. You come back. You enjoy the next sermon. You know, I, I, I want to I kind of set a course for us to take steps along for this year that's intentional. I'm not trying to give you my plan. I'm just suggesting collectively, let, let's, let's dig our hearts, let's, let's make our hearts a bit more receptive to faith being how we live our lives. Faith looking at God, looking at the promises that He's made, the purposes that He has for us that He's revealed to you, and believing that those things will come to pass without backing down but living in the balance of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. And this is part of the, this is part of the prayer in Ephesians 1, 17. He says that the God of our Lord... I'm, I'm confusing them back there. I usually turn this way. John, do you, you feel better now? All right, good. All right. He gave me a thumbs up. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Now, he's not talking about there's some spirit wandering around up in heaven called wisdom and another one called revelation. He's talking about pretty much living in the way of, you know, in the spirit of, in the, in the, the, the vein of to live this way. And we want to live in the, the, the way, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Wisdom is that practical application of knowledge. Wisdom sees an issue in your life realizes that the Word of God, the written Word of God, has solutions for pretty much everything you're going to face. And so your priority, your commitment, your, your obedience to the Lord is to go to His Word and search out the knowledge and then apply it, which is wisdom. So 
living in the balance of wisdom and revelation, it starts with wisdom in that you go to His Word, you get your mind filled with what His Word says about whatever it is that you're dealing with in your life, you know, and this is just a super practical thing. And, and I talk about this, and some people have never really made this a lifestyle. You know, some people pro- approach the Bible as if it's just a bunch of rules, and I don't understand it, and I know that I'm supposed to read it. By the way, it's January 8th. Did you already give up? on? You're probably halfway through Genesis in your Bible plan, and you, you didn't read this morning. You're on, I'm not talking to you. You're good. But we do that, right? It's like every January we get into Genesis and then you get to Deuteronomy and you're like, oh, what, the Bible plan? I don't, know. Don't, don't, don't beat yourself up over that. Most people aren't going to follow that, follow through with that. <clears throat> and that doesn't make you a bad Christian or a bad person. It just means that's not the right tool for you. But I do recommend find something where you're regularly getting in that word. You're regularly washing your mind and, f- and putting the seed of the word of God in your heart. That's the wisdom aspect. You're putting the knowledge in. You may not necessarily understand what it looks like for you, but you're reading it. Hopefully, while you're reading it, it becomes that logos, that living, breathing word. You know, I say all the time, give the written word an opportunity to become the living word for you. Because the living word, nobody can take away from you. The living word will change your life. The living word will give you solutions when you're confused. It'll bring healing when you're sick. All of the promises that Christ paid for. <clears throat> So, wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So, how do you know that you're properly applying wisdom? Well, what does Christ say about it? What does Christ expect of you? What is He leading you into? And then revelation, how many of you know people that are so revelation heavy, you're wondering if they've ever even read the Bible? Don't raise your hand. And don't hit your neighbor either. Are are you with me? It, but you need both. Revelation, and revelation is not when God says, ah, uh, let's see, uh, uh, today I think I'm going to show Hans something new. I think it's about time he finally knows this. I know I've been holding it back from him, and now I'm going to show him this. That, that's not re- Revelation is not when God decides to tell you something that he had not previously already made known to you. And I you know, did this last week, but revelation is, so I'm, I'm looking here, and there's that speaker, the speaker is in my way, but let's say that exactly on the wall over there in, in my line of sight past that speaker, there's something there that would be life-changing for me. Revelation is, I move over here, and now I can see it. But it's been there the whole time. I've discovered this thing that God has already put in place, and it's in Christ. Everything you ever need is in Christ. You don't need God to show up and do something apart from what He's already given you in Christ. He's given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. All His promises are yes and amen. You have the mind of Christ. You are complete in Him and you lack nothing. He's got a promise to all of His believers, the spiritual children of Abraham, that we would be kings and priests on this planet to be a blessing to the nations of the earth so that they would come to us and learn and to want to know God. There there are these constants that are in place that are just there to be discovered. God is not putting you in a rat maze where you got to run around and try to find the cheese. He's not, you know, testing you with lack in terms of you need something. Because most of us approach God that way. It's like there's something that I need to know, and I don't know it, and if God would just tell me, then I'd be good. Are you with me? We're so knowledge focused, that we can trend toward Gnosticism and as if knowledge and knowing information is the solution to all of our problems, and it's not. I mean, in some cases it is, but what the solution is, is Jesus manifesting in whatever aspect of Him that you need touches your life. And I don't want to quantify that for you. I I don't even know how to necessarily explain how Jesus leading you, that birthing of the seed, becomes the right leading into that new job, or how to change and be more loving towards your spouse, or how to pray for others and help them connect to a mirror. I don't, you know, that, that's the Holy Spirit's job. What I want to do in this series and throughout this year is just make the commitment to, you know what, first and foremost, I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. Before I go into anything, I'm going to make sure, am I in faith? And what would faith choose? Faith, so I've explained a lot about what faith is not. Faith is not 
what you do, listen to me, faith is not what you do to get God to respond to you. Faith is your response to what God has done in Christ. So if you're believing for something, you're not trying to believe for this thing that God is holding in His hands and how do you get it out of His hands into you. What you're believing is, how can I experience who God is? What is it that's keeping me from seeing? See, because we become Him, we become like Him as we behold Him. That's the secret of transformation. How do you see God? How can you see God more clearly? And spiritually, it's like this spiritual law that happens. I'm not saying you can manipulate it. It's just this. It's just what's encoded into the, the spiritual seed of beholding Him. You know, you put a, a seed in the ground and it births, it grows whatever kind of tree or plant that that is. Beholding God has the genetic spiritual DNA within it of you being conformed into His image. Are you with me? It's just the spiritual law that works. As you behold Him, you become like Him. You are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That predestined, that predestination is the seed of His Spirit that's been put on the inside of you, and it's trying to grow. It's trying to teach you. It's trying to shape you and transform you. That's the revelation side of it. We don't want to just fully live in revelation where we're just constantly trying to hear information from God. Amen? There's practical application wisdom, too, that when you don't, I can't hear God. I don't know what He's telling. Well, when's the last time you read Scripture related to the subject that you're trying to hear God for? I mean, I would ask, even ask you that question. That thing that you're praying for and you're seeking an answer from God, when's the last time you went to Scripture, searched out that topic related to that area that you're praying for, and found out what He already said about it? Because when you do that, I'm telling you, it will increase your chances of that revelation coming alive in that personal situation for you. Get in the Word, know it, meditate on it, and, and, but don't make it a dead work. You know, you're not going to the Word hoping God's going to show you something. You know, that's kind of like those of you that are married. You know what I'm saying? Good, you're with me. You're awake. <laughs> In this passage here, we've been talking a lot about. I've got I've got a ton of slides today, um, and, and as I said, this is going to unfold. There's so much to be said about this. I want to unpack this for a while, but I want to challenge you to search these things out for yourselves. You know, don't just listen to this as a sermon. How how can you make sure you're living by walking in faith and not by sight? Doesn't mean you ignore what you see. It just means am I Am I putting first that aspect of trusting God for this situation in spite of what I see? And always being hopeful, always being expectant. Faith is trust or dependency. Hope is a confident expectation of good things. So we, start, we started in looking at this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, faith is not... Again, it's not something, by the way, there's so much to be said about this. I'll try to stay on track, but you've been given the measure of faith. You've not been given a measure of faith. You've been given the measure. What measure is that? It's the same measure of Christ, Galatians 2.20. You know, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the measure of faith that you have. If you've been told you don't have enough faith, you've got to figure out how to get more faith, how to get my faith stronger, you know, you might can get your faith stronger, but you don't, you don't lack something. I want to get you out of the mindset of, I see that it says this in Scripture, I don't have it, I must be lacking something. And depending on your theology, you might look to your works. Well, I haven't done enough of this. I did too much of that. That's what's disqualifying me. No, it's not. Now, you should stay out of sin because it disrupts your heart, hardens your heart, desensitizes you to, the, to what God's trying to do in your life. Sin kills. Stay away from it. Stop it. Stop it. 
Are you with me? That's my philosophy on sin. Stop it. It's killing you. However, God's not seeking to disqualify you because of it. Should you continue in sin? God forbid. It will produce death on its own. That's one of the laws that we're going to be talking about. The law of sin and death and the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So the measure of faith you have. The examples of faith in Hebrews 11 show us that God draws us into a walk of faith to bless us and accomplish His purposes. You know, and that, that's where we're going with this whole series is staying focused on, I want to be in faith toward those things that I should be experiencing because of what Christ paid for in His death, burial, and resurrection. So it's personal. Some might call it selfish. I don't call it selfish. I just call it a good father has provided amazing blessings for me in the inheritance that he gave his son who has made me a joint heir with him of God. I've inherited everything Christ has inherited. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Amen? So for you to believe for promises and expect good things to happen in your life is consistent with how God wants to treat you. Amen? It's not selfish to believe that your life can be healthy and happy. Even in the midst of all that's going on, it's not selfish to believe that. In fact, if you aren't experiencing those things, how in the world are you going to be a blessing to other people? So, but it, so it is that. It's the personal promises, but it's also the purposes. And this is what in Hebrews 11, and I don't know if you had time to go and look at that, but I would encourage you. I'm not going to take the time to read it here, but this, so here's a homework assignment. Go home, read at least Hebrews 11. Go through the list. I mean, it talks about Moses and Enoch and Elijah and um, uh, Sarah and Abraham. One of the things I, I love what it says about Sarah, you know, Abraham's wife, who when they were 80, 90, 100 years old, it was promised to them that they would have a child. And, and, but yet their body's dead. And it says that even though she's believing, even though Abraham's body's as good as dead, she believed. You know, thank God for Sarah. I mean, Abraham jumped out and made a mistake, but it's almost like she's the one that kind of remained faithful. And, and it says specifically that she became be, trusting. Get, get this. This is what we're talking about. Trusting in the promise that God had made to her, she trusted in that. She didn't try to make God do it. She didn't try to make it happen. She didn't try to figure out what she was doing wrong. All she made sure she was doing according to what is listed in Hebrews 11, is that she stayed competent in what God had promised her. Those are the promises that I want you to be confident in, the things that God has promised you. Now, there's general promises and there's specific promises. That's where the wisdom and revelation comes in. The general promises are all wrapped up in what Jesus paid for. That's why we need to know Him. Know the power of Christ and Him crucified. Know the power of His resurrection. Know what He paid for in His atoning work. Know what is legally yours as a result of the new covenant. You have a right to stand and believe for those things. And I, and I happen to believe it's all wrapped up in salvation. The word saved, sozo, soteria, which is wholeness of mind, healing, spirit, soul, and body preservation, rescue, restoration, to make you prosperous, which is consistent with what God wants to do through you, be a blessing through you. Amen? So there's promises for you to believe for. In every situation of your life, there's promises from God for you to believe for. Do you know what they are? And are you standing on them? When God's promises, when you're unsure of how those promises might come to pass in your life, that's an indication that you're thinking carnally about those things. Carnal thinking is not necessarily you're in sin or you're, you know, you're evil or wicked or anything like that. Carnal thinking is, I liken it to, it's more like Newtonian. You know, it's not going to move unless I push on it. Push for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Like, I don't understand how I'm going to, what, I, what do I got to do to get this response? That's, to me, that's Newtonian faith. I want to have quantum faith where an observation seems to make the difference. You know, human observation seems to affect the outcome. Interaction. That, that, if you don't, any quantum physics nerd kind of geeky people, I didn't call you a nerd, like two people. Let me just say, how many of you are interested in quantum physics discoveries there? That's better. 
Don't be calling me a nerd. Uh, anyway, I don't want to have this action and then equal and opposite reaction mindset when it comes to faith. I want to have the mindset of faith is that all things are possible for those who believe. Amen? And that's what I'm suggesting we move into 2023 with is we make sure. Am I seeing this situation as if anything is possible? Or am I upset because it hasn't come to pass yet? Now, I get it. Some of you are going through some things that, that it's, a, it's borderline offensive when we speak to those matters or life in general from this perspective as if all things are possible because you've been dealing with things for years and you've tried and you've believed and you've worked and you've done everything you possibly can do and, and it just hasn't come to pass. And I understand that. And I'm, I'm compassionate toward that. I, I am. I don't want to be insensitive and, and just overlook that. I get it. I understand there are, there are caretakers watching people that they love suffer even as we speak. There are people riddled with pain and, 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 and disease and difficulty and challenge, and yet your, your heart is open to the Lord. I, I see that. So I don't want to undermine that, but I also don't want to minimize Scripture. I don't want to minimize. I don't want to allow our circumstances to dilute impossibilities becoming realities. Are you with me? It's just, it's this paradise, the difficult challenge of living life in a broken world, yet believing what's possible is something that Jesus prayed, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think, I think what actually makes that clear is the understanding that God wants everything for you that Christ paid for you to experience. He's not hiding He's not withholding, but there's something on our end to connect. So that's the kind, that's what I want to talk about in faith. How do we do that hard inner work of repentance to make sure that we're in faith and obedience toward God to experience everything that Jesus paid for us, all the promises, but also the purposes, the responsibilities that we have in life, personally, towards your immediate surroundings, and then your calling, that ministerial calling. I don't mean getting a job in the ministry. I mean, you know, working the counter at the grocery store that you work at and somehow being the life and the light of Jesus in that place. You know, whatever it is, we all have a ministry. Promises and purposes, we want to believe, but it all comes together in the knowledge of Him. So, that... We're going to be just talking about that for a while. There's always promise in purpose. I want you to seek those purposes and experience the promises. And there's going to be some things that we do along the way that you, you know, you journal or you <clears throat> just define some things that you feel. I mean, how many of you got, you feel like God's shown you some things that he wants you to, that he's called you into, like assignments or purposes? How many of you feel like you've got some things on your heart, but you're just not sure what to do about it? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody would raise their hand on that. So with that as our focus, I want to kind of camp around this idea of the laws of the kingdom of God. So the laws of the kingdom of God or the laws of the spiritual dimension and this idea of cooperating with the laws of the spiritual dimension. Now, these are some that I've listed here. And again... I don't want to make it and present it as if we just got to fully jump over into this revelatory. Applying that knowledge, but also the wisdom or, or the revelation, that living aspect, that breathing aspect, that interactive aspect of God, but all being held together and anchored in, you could call it anchored in the theology, Christology, proper Christology, whatever, whatever technical terms you want to call it. Jesus makes it all make sense, right? Jesus brings it from just an idea into a possibility, and that living, breathing, spiritual aspect of it, the revelation aspect, we, we had an exercise in here. We do a monthly thing we call equip which is based on the idea of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. You're the saints. If you said yes to Jesus, you're a saint. Not because you've performed your way into it, 
but because God has changed what kind of being that you are. Amen? So there's these laws, and, and I'm, not, I'm not going to necessarily, we're definitely not going to cover all these today, but I am going to pick a few of these. Which ones are the most interesting to you? As you read these, y'all, y'all just let me know, speak out, which ones kind of stand out to you? Law of love, law of love. yeah. Anybody else? The law of the spirit of life, you know, and that's so that's in Romans 8, right? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and it's we, the law of liberty, yeah. So we've been, we, we aren't, the, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. The law, scripture is careful to use the terminology law, the law of the spirit of life sets you free from the law of of sin and death. I want to operate in that law of the spirit of life. How do we do that? Well, that's that revelatory aspect. That's that revelation aspect. And it's not a special revelation to you. It's an uncovering of something that's already there. Are you with me? We're not talking about you got to go to God and get some kind of special information and you are the one that understands it. Nobody else understands it. It's more like an uncovering of this thing. And so to that, to that idea, And I've got a ton of slides, so let me go ahead and just kind of click through these. Everybody good? You with me? We're not, so so these laws, we're not talking about moral, civil, or dietary laws. Those are the kind of laws that make make up the Old Covenant, right? Those are the categories that make up Old Covenant law, the ones that Christ fulfilled fully for us and set us free delivered us into the new new covenant. So the laws that we're talking about, the law of the spirit of life, the law of love, the law of faith, the law of sowing and reaping, all those kinds of things, we're not talking about these kinds of laws that are to be judged and governed, okay? So in other words, it's not an action and reaction type of thing. They're constant laws of the spiritual dimension, like the physical laws of nature or the laws of physics, you know, gravity, strong and weak nuclear force, electromagnetic energy. There's consistent laws. Like gravity was discovered, not created. And gravity, once discovered by the person that discovered it, didn't have the monopoly on gravity and also didn't understand everything that there was to know about it. And we've since grown and learned and learned and more, more and more about it. But it's a consistent law that's in place, right, that you cooperate with or violate and If you fall off of a ladder and hurt yourself, it's not because gravity is choosing to teach you a lesson that day. Are you with me? The law of life is a constant, consistent thing that the Spirit of God is always emanating into your life. Now, they are spiritual laws, so they operate in a different plane but we're not disconnected from that spiritual dimension. We're right in the midst of it now, right? Again, I don't want to jump too far into the revelatory talk, revelation talk, because we always want to keep it anchored in wisdom, but in the knowledge of Christ. The knowledge of Christ digs into the wisdom and pulls it out to be experienced, but it also keeps the revelation anchored, but it pulls one to the other, right? Living in this balance. So they're constant, law. They're, they're consistent. They're not personal meaning they're not evaluated for each person per case. The law of the spirit of life, God's not determining if the law of the spirit of life is going to work for you or not. What do you think the law of the spirit of life, the effects of it might be? Raising the dead. Raising the dead. I mean, you just went straight for it. But yes, that too. You know, I'm thinking again, Romans 8, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is giving life to your physical body. That is, a, that is, to me, an expression of the law of life. It is a constant. It is consistent. It is not God choosing to give you that life or not give you that life. It is, a, it is in place, consistent, upheld by the power of His Word, there to be experienced. And, and, and I'm not going to tell you how to experience it because I don't really necessarily know. It, but it, but the, we all need that revelation, case by case, situation by situation, so that you're in faith toward God, which then puts you in a place to experience this law of life that is there to be discovered for you. Are you with me? All right, so 
Uh, they can be discovered and cooperated with by anyone who will believe. Co cooperating with the laws of the kingdom bring life. We cooperate with the laws of God's kingdom by grace through faith. The same way we get saved, we continue to walk in Him by grace through faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. I'm going to go kind of fast here for a minute. Faith is typically thought of as a belief in spite of the lack of evidence. Like, I'm going to believe, even though I'm not really sure, don't really understand, I don't, un I don't have the right information. But no, faith, back all the way up here, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the e faith is the evidence. If you're looking for proof of God's promises to you, it's in your faith. And he here's what faith is. Let's say uh, it's a healing issue, and you, are, you know Jesus. You have some type of relationship and connection with Him. There's two different views of faith. Faith is, Jesus, would you please touch me and heal me? And the other is, Jesus, I need to be convinced that you've already given this to me. You are already that thing on the inside of me. Yeah, you might ask, help me, ex help me experience this. But it's not a promise that is outside of you that you have to somehow to convince him to give to you. Are you with me? So faith is becoming confident in what he's done, not how do I get him to do it, resting in the finished work of Christ. So back down to this. It's typically thought of as a belief in spite of lack of evidence, but faith itself is the evidence. Faith is not a simple choice to believe in God. Faith is a response to God revealing Himself to you. It takes faith or a willingness of heart to discern God's drawing to Himself. Faith is the proof that you perceive God. Faith is the evidence that, that what you're confidently expecting will come to pass. And then you look at passages like this, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore I say to you, all things are possible. Now this is, this is a little bit different translation that you're probably used to. The typical translation would be um, believe that you... Uh, let me just read this. I think this is the New, uh, I mean the, uh, New American Standard. Therefore I say to you, all things from which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Will be granted. Now that sounds like I got to believe, and then God will give it to me. I got to believe, and then God will grant it to me right? And we're living in this lifestyle of by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. And then down into Hebrews eleven six, 6, and this is part of your homework, and I hope that you really take the time to go through and look at each person that's mentioned in that list there, because what they did, God came to them, made them a promise, they trusted God. They didn't go to God and ask Him to do some big thing right? Like the roll call of faith as it's listed there in Hebrews. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you come up with some grand idea and then try to get God to do that thing for you. I'm only suggesting that you remain confident in that which God promised to you will come to pass. And, and then dig into the, pur the purposes we're going to get to in, in a few weeks. But So faith, so, and without, this is after he talks about Enoch but he says here, and, and without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who approaches Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, I know I've said a lot so far, but this right here is what today's message is about. This is the main point that I want you to get out of this. He's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek Him or who diligently seek Him. Now, if you have a Newtonian version of faith, I have to push to get, I have to cause an action to get a reaction, then you think you got to do faith, and then God says, oh, good job with your faith. I'll grant to you this, right? Or you have that quantum version of unlimited potential and possibility, and your observation of it is what becomes your reality. And that's it. Now, that, there's a lot to go into that, but so let me, let me just show you this. I, and I, and I, I present it that way based on a couple of passages. 
I love this one. And this one is presented that way too. Proverbs 25, 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's concealed things for you, but it is to your honor to search out that matter. Now, watch this. I've got this point here. All the pilots will know who this guy is. Daniel Bernoulli. Is, am I saying that right? Bernoulli? The Bernoulli principle, is that what it is? You know, so he discovered the law of lift back in the 1700s. And all of flight, the wing development and everything's based on the, the Bernoulli principle of, of airplanes working with thrust, positioning wings properly, engaging the law of lift supersedes the law of gravity. There's zero reason that something that weighs a couple of tons should break the law of gravity and fly up in the air unless you apply some other principles and laws that supersede that law. Spiritual laws supersede natural physical laws. The law of life, the law of sowing and reaping, the law of uh, love, the law of faith, those are all constants and consistents that must engage the law of lift somehow to supersede the natural law of sin and death, the natural law of sowing and reaping, the natural law of loss and depression, the natural law of whatever it is that we're experiencing. Faith is the thrust. In other words, it's it's, it's what gets you to get up and supersede that law of gravity that's trying to pull you down that law of sin and death in the spirit realm that's trying to produce death in your life, faith operates within you in such a way that brings you into a place where you can experience these spiritual laws. Are you with me? And it's not cause and effect. You're not breaking laws. You're just operating in a different way to experience. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. Well, join the club. (laughs) I'd be surprised if this makes 100% sense to you. Because we're talking about spiritual things. We're talking about a dimension that we can't see. We're talking about passages like this. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. How does that work? How does the Word frame everything? So that the things which are seen were not, by, were not made of things which are visible. That, that's what we're talking about. Here's what we're talking about. We're tra- talking about trying. You all know what we're talking about? Well, I say it four times now. We're trying to live in a way where we're engaged in experiencing the will of something that we can't see. And we live faithful and hopeful and trusting in this capacity so that the things which are seen were not made by the things which are visible. It's not that they're not real. And faith somehow puts us in that place where we experience a different dimension. So the Bernoulli principle. Uh, Bernoulli discovered the law of lift. Now, now this is, you could call this revelation. I'm not trying to say, thus saith the Lord, but I feel like God showed me this to help me understand, and that is this. The Wright brothers, you guys know who the Wright brothers were. The Wright brothers were rewarded with flight when they searched out the law of lift. All right, so it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search. So, Does this mean God's hiding something from you or it's concealed? The Wright brothers were rewarded with flight when they searched out the law of lift. So some other dude discovered the law of lift. Did he make the law of lift? No. Did the Wright brothers discover even the law of lift? No. No. But working off of his uh, discovery, you know, they searched it out. Everything that you need from God is not hidden from you, but it is concealed in Christ, and we search it out, and we search it out by faith. But faith is not an exercise to get God to respond to you. Faith is an exercise for you to be fully convinced of who God is. Your job is to persuade your heart that God is who He says that He is. Did God say He is a provider? Do you need provision? It's there to be discovered. Did God say he's a healer? Do you need healing? Do you know people that need healing? 
It's there to be discovered and uncovered and experienced. Are you with me? The law of life is a consistent, constant, accessible. How? I'm not quite sure. But I know that God says it's possible. He describes himself as the nature of that thing. He says he's a healer. Says he provision. So then, okay, so then let me just try to understand here. So God came to the earth and, as a human, and what did he do? He didn't go around just condemning everybody and telling them we're worthless. No, what did he, he healed people. Wow, you think about that. God, when he became human, showed us who he is, and he went around healing people. That's who God is. That's what I want to define my faith. Those are the kinds of things that I want to... And this is not just a message about healing. I'm just talking about that as an example. That's the kind of stuff that I want to assimilate in my gathering of knowledge and wisdom to give me revelation on who God is, to experience who God is. So the Wright brothers were rewarded with flight when they searched out the law of lift and we're living in this balance of wisdom and revelation. We are rewarded with provision when we search out the provider. Remember, God's pleased with faith. We must believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, I think He isn't. It's not like He's just sitting there and saying, you know, cold, cold, warmer, warmer. Warmer. Ooh, you close. Ah, oh, you missed it. Ah, oh, you missed it. You dummy. No, he's like, he's like there. He's like, no, that when you become convinced of who I am, then you will see the next step that you need to take yes. to experience that which is concealed for you to discover. Know him. I'm telling you, get to know him. You want to know what you should do with your life? Get to know Jesus. How do you get to know Jesus? Well, that's between you and the Lord. I don't have seven steps of no God. How, much, how, how badly do you want to know Him? And if your motivation is to get something out of Him, I don't know. You know let me know how that works for you. I don't know. We uncover healing as we search out the healer. We discover purpose when we know our maker. Always being willing to put action and confidence to our faith. I've got a few other statements here about faith. But I think that's enough. I want to wrap up on this idea. We want to continue. And I think I'll probably end all of, most of these messages on this idea because we want to kind of talk about faith, put it in our mind, put it in our heart, shake it up a little bit, but then bring it down to, okay, this is the focus of my faith. This is what we're moving toward, experiencing His promises and living out His purposes. So I, I want all of us to be thinking about what promises do, what promises do I have from God to, to be experiencing? How can I make sure I'm in faith toward Him having that hopeful, confident expectation, not giving up. Much like all the people in Hebrews 11 that you see. Hebrews 11, there's so much adversity that they experienced, but yet they believed what God said. What did God say about your situation? That's what you want to do. Faith to experience His promises and fulfill His purposes. Hope, this is kind of instructional, hope in what God wants for you. Those promises, those personal things that Jesus paid for. Keep hope in those things. Be willing to have faith in that stuff. Don't give up. I get it. Life hurts. We get disappointed. But it's your job to keep that spirit. That, 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 to me, that's one of the greatest aspects of church is that we get to come back in and just get this stuff stirred up in our hearts, right? I mean, that worship, man, I'm, I'm like, let's just go home after the worship. That was so good today. But that's why we do this. And then hope in what God wants to do through you. I'm going to be talking about that more in upcoming weeks. We have another guy coming, uh, Brian Essery. I, I, can't, I forget the dates. Is that in February? April 9th. Oh, April 9th. So it's actually kind of toward the end, but I'll, I'll talk more about what that is. But So the question is, what has God promised you? If we're keeping our hearts and hope and faith toward promises and purposes, what has He promised you? What do you know? Again, there's those general promises, and then there's these personal promises. What purpose has God revealed to you? And when I think about purpose, it's twofold. The reason you exist is because God wanted you as His child. He just gave you life. That's it. You recognize Him as your Father. Your purpose or the reason you exist, the reason you're alive, is fulfilled. 
you know God is your Father. But now that you know who you are, there are assignments and purposes that He wants you to walk out and complete as a representative of His family. And I fiercely want to pursue those things. I don't want to miss the purposes and the assignments that He has for me. Even if it's just an assignment that's for tomorrow and I do it and that's it, or if it's a lifetime of sticking to one thing, I want to do that. I, I personally want to be able to have something that I'm giving my hand to that brings a sense of meaning, brings a sense of fulfillment, brings a sense of direction. You know, that this, this, is defi- this, is, this is rewarding. You know, it's rewarding to be able to get to sow into this and put my hand to this and, experience, and co-labor with God and co-labor with people. It's, it's life-giving. It's enriching. I want you to have that. I know a lot of people, you just work your jobs, you come home, you know, maybe you hang out with your family or you don't, and it's like, you know, you just feel like you're in the rat race. You just feel like you're doing the same thing every, every day. Maybe you have a job, but you're not really sure about it. I don't really like it. No. I'm not suggesting that you're going to know exactly what God wants you to do, and you can sometimes. I think we can. But just in general, you're involved in such a way where you're you're not judging yourself, but yet you're pulling yourself into something to give your hand to something. I, man, I'm telling you, especially these people that are heavy in the revelation side of it, will say, well, God gave me this prophecy and I'm just waiting for Him to do it. You know, I don't know. I've just had this confirmation, this confirmation, this confirmation. It's like, you call it a confirmation, but is it something that's really in your heart? That's a can of worms that I'm just not going to go into at the moment. <laughs> and then this, how will you prioritize hope in God's promises and purpose, purposes for your life this year? How are you going to prioritize, schedule, put deadlines on, engage yourself, invest in yourself, invest in other people, invest in the kingdom, search out whatever it is that you're believing for? How are you going to prioritize making sure that you're walking by faith and not by sight and the promises and purposes that God has for you. What are you going to do to stay in faith? Is that a daily Bible reading plan? You know, is that take a course? Is that search out Scripture? Is that get people to pray? I mean, what, what is it? What is, how are you going to stay in faith? How are you intentionally going to stay in faith? And then how are you intentionally going to pursue those purposes that God has revealed to you? And if you don't know any of the purposes that God has revealed to you, what can you do to kind of help narrow that down? Because I know you don't want to just work your job. I know you don't want to just go through this life. And, and, you know, it's funny when people first come into this perspective, they're happy that God's not mad at them. Right? You're happy that it's not about your works, and you're happy that whether you give or not, God wants to bless you financially. You're not under a curse. Christ was the curse of the law for you. And that's dangerous to... By the way, it's like we, had, we didn't have church on Christmas and the giving was higher. I'm just not going to talk about giving because y'all give more when we don't have church. So That's kind of a joke, but it actually was. Anyway, um, but, I'm, but you don't, you're not working some legalistic law in that area, right? But I want to prioritize it. Personally, I want to prior, make sure that I'm in faith. Amen? So just for another minute or two, let's just stand up, and I want you to think about that. And now, you may not connect to this exercise in this environment, but I do want to challenge you. In some way, define the promises and the purposes that God has for you. And a lot of us have promises that we've tried to believe for and we're disappointed. So let's just pray. Father, I thank you. I pray for those. I lift those up to you that have genuinely believed you, have tried to stand in faith towards you, And just there's some kind of disconnect. Father, I thank you that you're comforting us in those moments, people that are in this room, watching online, listening later, that your word is as powerful in those moments as it is right here. Father, I thank you that your spirit, first and foremost, bears witness with our spirit that we are your children. You are with us. You will never forsake us. You are pleased with us because we are in Christ. And just just ask Him. If there's disappointment, just ask Him. Help me with that, Lord. Help me with the disappointment so that it doesn't harden my heart, so so that it doesn't desensitize me towards You. 
I just, I just want to know your love for me. I want to walk in this peace. I want to, I want to constantly experience this peace. Even in the midst of this physical situation that I can't change at the moment. I don't even know what to do. God, I just give that to you. I'm willing to stay in faith towards you. And just, just give it to him. Just, just let it go. Take a deep breath. Relax. Father, I give you that disappointment. And then on the flip side, find that confidence. Promises and purposes. So just think about one promise. One promise, whether it be a general promise in the blood of Christ or a promise that God has made you that may even be related. Maybe it's a promise to live out a purpose. But just think about that. God, it's, 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 I, don't, well, I don't want to think about it. Sometimes it's kind of hard to go back to it because I've put it down and I've become comfortable and complacent and it's too hard to try to believe again. And I, I, I just give all of that to Him. And make the decision that you're going to walk by faith and not by sight. In this particular situation, you're going to walk by faith and not by sight. You're going to dig back into your heart again and you're going to choose to trust Him. I'm going to place all my faith in you. And just say that, Father, I walk by faith and not by sight in your promises and purposes for my life. So, Father, I thank you that those promises, that your Spirit is nurturing those even right now, you're, you're bringing revelation to that wisdom that's in the hearts, that it starts right now, and as they, we leave here and we go throughout our days and weeks, that are because we're choosing to stay in faith towards you and believe that the impossible is possible if you've promised it, we're first and foremost going to make sure that we are in faith towards you. And all that means is we're going to be confident that you are who you say that you are. I trust you. Just tell him, I trust you, Lord. Father, we thank you that your spirit is alive and active in this place. I thank you that you're inside of each believer, but you're also moving among us, ministering, touching hearts, touching bodies, bringing life and peace and healing, bringing restoration, giving those insights and wisdoms, giving us strength and courage so that we're just built up, so that we leave feeling better than when we came in. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Just worship him a little bit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. Thank you, Father. You're the preeminent one, the one to be glorified, the one to be worshipped. You're everything to me, and I just want to know you. I just want to know you. I want to be sensitized to your spirit to experience everything that you want for me, that you want for me, and that you want to do through me, and I give it to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You know, and if you're in here or you're watching online, I just want to put this passage up. It's super easy to get saved. If you're not a Christian, you're not sure. Sometimes we have people come in, and it's like they're, they're feeling the waters. They're testing it out. They're not necessarily ready to say some prayer, but it's super easy. This is Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How many of you are saved? Yeah, amen. I know we do it a little bit opposite. I've had people ask, why don't you do traditional altar calls? Well, I have a reason, and I'll tell you, but I want people to engage. So we have a prayer team that you guys will slide up here. If you're new to the faith and you want to make sure that you're secure in Christ, I want you to come up and talk to these guys. If you need prayer for anything at all, and we're going to make prayer kind of more of a, a process of this series, even corporately praying for each other, helping each other stand in faith, encouraging each other, strengthening each other. But again, I don't want this to just be a sermon. We go out and it's like, that was interesting. The laws of the kingdom are to, to be discovered, and we want to stay in faith toward him so that we experience his promises and his purposes. Amen. Amen. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. 
So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you, he's for you, he will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church slash connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.